everyone. On today's podcast, we're going to talk with Brittany Sharp McCollum about pelvic biomechanics and fetal positioning during labor. Welcome to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. My name is Rebecca Decker, and I'm a nurse with my PhD and the founder of Evidence-Based Birth. Join me each week as we work together to get evidence-based information into the hands of families and professionals around the world. As a reminder, this information is not medical advice. See evbirth.com slash disclaimer for more details. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. My name is Rebecca Decker, pronouns she, her, and I will be your host for today's episode. We are so excited to welcome our guest, Brittany Sharp McCollum, and if there are any content or trigger warnings that go along with this episode, we'll post them in the description or the show notes that go along with this episode. Brittany Sharp McCollum, pronouns she, her, is the owner of Blossoming Bellies Holistic Birth Services based out of the greater Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area, providing childbirth education classes, birth doula services, and dynamic labor support and pelvic biomechanics training workshops, both for professionals and expectant parents. Brittany has been offering birth work services since 2007 and continues to work towards change in the maternity care system in two ways. First, Brittany offers expectant parents in-person and virtual group and self-paced childbirth education and doula support, guiding parents in developing the tools they need to be actively involved in their care. Second, she shares her trainings on evidence-based fetal positioning and pelvic dynamics and biomechanics through conference presentations, workshops, and webinars for health and birth professionals. Brittany is a sought-after speaker at many international childbirth conferences, including a standing-room-only presentation at the Evidence-Based Birth Conference in 2019. In addition, Brittany facilitates private workshops virtually and in person, as well as two annual trainings open to the larger birth community. Brittany is a contributing author to the book Baby Got v She is a frequent contributor to panel discussions and events for the birth community, and she's been a guest lecturer for several years at the University of Pennsylvania's midwifery program. Brittany also developed and facilitated the online ICEA training for birth professionals on anatomy and reproductive structure. So we are welcoming Brittany, who lives in South Jersey with her partner and four children. Her website is blossomingbelliesbirth.com, and she's on Instagram at blossomingbelliesbirth. We are so thrilled that you're here. Welcome, Brittany, to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. Thank you so much. It is a totally an honor to be here and talking with you today. Thank you. It's so wonderful to have you here, especially after we had such an amazing experience with you at the conference in 2019. But take us back to the beginning. How did you get started as a birth worker? Yeah, so the conference was amazing also. So it was it was a fantastic conference all around and it was a really great great presentation to that day. Let's see, how did I get started? My oldest is about to be 15 years old and I think it was both my pregnancy and birth experience with him that really kind of set the stage for me diving into birth work. I guess I started on my journey into doing birth work a few months after he was born, but it was my pregnancy with him that left me so fascinated with the body and the adjustments that the body makes and what the body is capable of. I also felt like there was a bit of a disconnect between everything I was learning in pregnancy and the expectations that my providers had for me in labor and birth. I did not necessarily get straight answers to questions, but I let it go. I didn't recognize that as a red flag. Um, And I came out of my birth feeling really kind of unsupported by my providers and feeling like they didn't offer a whole lot. So I felt like it shouldn't be like this. I was so excited in pregnancy for birth and so excited just to be kind of entering into this journey and had really high expectations for the providers that I chose and then came out of it feeling like, oh, wow, that was not what I thought it would be. And that kind of sparked in me a passion to learn more about the birth process and the system that people give birth in. And the more I learned, the more fascinated I became with it and started to um, explore certifying as an educator and then certifying as a doula. So by the time my son was a year old, I had started teaching childbirth classes and then also attending births as a doula. Oh, wow. So you've been in this work for more than a decade now. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that makes it sound really long. <laughs> when you say well, I mean, you know, it's, it's quite an achievement, actually. Thank so you. when did you start 
realizing the importance of like pelvic biomechanics and fetal positioning and labor? Like, was there a moment in your career when you realized that this was a big deal and this was affecting a lot of births? Absolutely. Yes. It wasn't right away. It was a few years in that I started realizing, kind of putting a lot of things together and realizing that here I am working with primarily first-time parents as a doula and seeing people whose labors had stalled out or who were winding up having cesarean births because their babies got quote unquote stuck in the pelvis. And it didn't sit right with me because I felt like here we are with low risk pregnancy, a healthy birthing person and a situation that winds up leading to major abdominal surgery. And so I started diving a little bit more into the movement side of labor and birth. And, you know, we always kind of think of movement as comfort. We move to stay comfortable during labor. But there's so much more to movement than just comfort. And I started exploring resources that were not related to birth, resources that were instead related to kinesiology and anthropology resources and physical therapy resources, and realizing that there was this huge missing piece of the puzzle in the way that we were approaching birth. There was movement looked at for comfort, but not necessarily understanding how the bones of the pelvis move to create space for the baby as the baby descends and rotates. So it was a few years into my birth work that I started exploring all these other resources. And then let's see, I had my second son, I guess about six years into doing birth work. And at that point I knew I would be scaling back a little bit on attending births as a doula. So I started to put together all of the the information that I had accumulated through these different resources into somewhat of a, a workshop format. And when my second son was about six weeks old, I taught a workshop on utilizing movement in labor and birth to help prevent stalls in the process. And it started out as a two hour workshop and it has just grown tremendously and is now a two day workshop that I facilitate. And the more I learn, I mean, I'm always learning more about movement and birth and movement in birth and dynamics. And it's just, it feels like this missing piece because it's not something that a lot of providers are utilizing, and it's not something that's really a part of most doula training. So I feel like it's this really important piece of the puzzle that is often overlooked. Okay. So give our listeners a little bit of a primer. Like what is pelvic biomechanics and like how does that relate to the baby's position during labor? Yeah. Yeah. So kind of a mouthful, pelvic biomechanics, pelvic dynamics, fetal positioning. It's a lot of stuff to wrap your head around. So I think Breaking it down really simply is is the best place to start. So when we're talking about pelvic, obviously we're relating to the pelvis. Biomechanics really relates to the principles or laws that guide the outcomes of, in this case, movement with the pelvis. And so when we're thinking about biomechanics of the pelvis, for example, we might say, well, when we externally rotate the thigh, that applies pressure in at the hips and the biomechanical outcome would be decreased space at the pelvic outlet. So dynamics of the pelvis refer to the movements and biomechanics refers to the kind of outcome of those movements. If I could just interrupt briefly, what's the difference between the pelvic inlet and pelvic outlet for, for parents who don't understand that? Absolutely. So the pelvis has three main spaces within it, and the inlet is the top area of the pelvis or the top plane of the pelvis where the baby enters in. And then we have the mid pelvis, which is midway through the pelvis. And then we have the outlet, which is at the bottom of the pelvis where the baby comes out. So these three sort of planes of the pelvis require different movements in order to help create space depending on where the baby is. So that's kind of the the fetal positioning and, and station part of it. The station refers to where the baby is in the pelvis. And the fetal position refers to how the baby is presenting through the pelvis. Is the back of the baby's head along the right side of the person's body? Is it along the left side of the person's body? Is it towards the back? Is it towards the front? So depending on how a baby may be positioned and depending on where a baby is within those three planes of the pelvis, we have the opportunity to use specific positions to create space in order to help facilitate the baby's rotation and to help facilitate space change where the baby is within those three planes of the pelvis. One thing that I like to remind people is that the pelvis doesn't just open. You know, we hear so often like, 
when we're attending births, we hear providers say, open the pelvis. The pelvis doesn't just open all at once because it has these different areas and it responds differently to changes in pressure. When we open the top of the pelvis, the bottom, the outlet actually closes. When we open the outlet or the bottom of the pelvis, the top closes. So we have to kind of think, how can we suggest or encourage specific positions in labor that will open that space where the baby needs it? So are you talking about like you would want to help open the top part of the pelvis at one point of labor and open the bottom part of the pelvis or the outlet at another point in labor, depending on where the baby is? Exactly. That was a much more succinct way of saying it. (laughs) So how do you know, like, first of all, is there something intuitive? Like, because I feel like obviously we have messed and tinkered with the process of birth so much that most people end up laying on their backs in bed with an epidural. I mean, the vast majority of people in the United States at least do. So if we remove that and you're having a physiologic birth and more of a a setting that encourages natural behavior, do you find that most people move in the way that they need or do they need to be encouraged? I love that question. I find that most people move as their body tells them to, and that's exactly what they need for labor. Like this is such instinctive stuff. It's just like you said, it's kind of been blurred by this management of the laboring process that we have um, in in this country, but also in other countries around the world. Um, We've kind of lost sight of those instinctive things that people do to help facilitate the process. I love to tell people like, this is not rocket science. This is really basic stuff. And you actually, in a physiologic birth, which we can define that too, in a physiologic birth, what you're doing when you're moving is helping the baby to descend and rotate. The idea, though, also is that we want to be able to take those instinctive movements that people do during labor and birth without medication and then replicate that or modify it if necessary so that people who have epidurals in labor can still get those great benefits of movement and position changes. One of the greatest myths out there uh, in regards to labor and birth is the idea that if you have an epidural, you can't move. That cannot be further from the truth. With epidurals, there are so many different positions and even movements within positions that can be done. And so we want to take those instinctive movements that people do without pain medication and then apply them and modify if necessary for use uh, with people who have, have epidurals too, so that they can get those great benefits also. Okay. So can I give you a few scenarios and you yeah. tell me what, okay. I know you didn't prep for this, but okay. I feel like you can handle it. All right. I like All it. Right. So <laughs> say you're, say you're having a long induction and you're very early in the process. Maybe you're only a couple centimeters dilated. They've been doing cervical ripening. You've been having a lot of discomfort, so you get an epidural. You're not in active labor yet. Like, What should you be thinking about in terms of movement of the pelvis and the biomechanics of the pelvis and the baby's position? Yeah, great question. So first and foremost, movement is more important than any specific position. I know we're talking about specific positions, okay. but I always want to tell people, if you forget the specific things to do at which point in labor, just remember to move. So my guideline, actually in my classes, I teach this Blossoming Bellies 543 rule, which basically says change position every five contractions, no matter where you are in labor, whether okay. you're at the very beginning or the very end, somewhere in the middle, Every five contractions, we should be trying a new position. The thing is that when I tell people that, they're like, well, that sounds exhausting. But in early labor, your contractions are farther apart. So it's, you know, you might be moving every 30 minutes, 45 minutes, something like that. In active labor, of course, you're moving more frequently. But the other parts of that kind of rule are the four basic positions that we're going to use. That's the four in that rule. They're going to be standing, seated, all fours, and reclined. So if in the scenario you gave someone has an epidural, then standing positions are kind of out of the question at that point. But we have seated positions, we have all fours that can be done on the bed, and we have side-lying or reclined positions that can also be done on the bed. And then we change them up in three basic ways. That's the three from that rule. And those basic ways that we create um, or change space in the pelvis is how we rotate our thighs. So actually the rotation of our thighs affects space in the pelvis how we tilt our sacrum or iliac bones. So basically doing pelvic tilts, rounding or arching the lower back. And so the third part of that rule is asymmetry, doing something on only one side of the body rather than doing it on both sides at the same time. 
So what I would say in that scenario is change position really frequently. And let's say the baby is at the inlet of the pelvis, which is what we were talking about before, the top of the pelvis. They're kind of high up still. Exactly. Yeah. Then what we would want to focus on is having wide knees. So that would be external thigh rotation and incorporating some pelvic tilts or some rounded back positions to help pull the top of the sacrum out of the way and remembering to change position often. So we might take a seated position that is maybe like a a butterfly position, you know, the soles of the feet together, the thighs externally rotated, sitting like that through five contractions with the epidural in the bed, and then maybe side lying with a peanut ball between the thighs for five contractions. Then we have external thigh rotation and we have asymmetry because it's happening on only the top thigh, that opening of the top thigh. So remembering to move frequently is important. Remembering if the baby is high up at the inlet that we're using wide knees and we're trying to incorporate some rounded lower back and we're incorporating that asymmetry into those positions as well. Okay. So high baby, wide knees. (laughs) And the five, four, three rule, you said, so every five contractions, you said the four different types of positions you can try. Mm -hmm. And then what was the third Thing again? The, the three ways that we change space within those positions. Okay. The, three the thigh rotation, the pelvic okay. tilts, and the asymmetry. And the reason that I like to use that rule is because it's important to emphasize that it doesn't have to be big, drastic, dramatic movements. Because if we're thinking, especially as a first time parent, maybe we have a longer labor in front of us, we don't want to be exhausted by the time we get to the pushing part of labor. So if we just think, well, if I just rotate my thighs differently, or if I just lift one leg up and, you know, rather than lifting both legs up, now I've created asymmetry. These little subtle changes that we can do with with the space in the pelvis make a really big difference for giving the baby the ability to wiggle down and out. So it doesn't have to be climbing the stairs for five hours straight. It can be like Mm -hmm. side lying on one side and then side lying on the other side, hiking the leg up towards the chest and stretching out the bottom leg and then switching it up. It doesn't have to be really exhaustive positions and movement that seems really dramatic. I think it's really important because you're, I was thinking, especially for people who have um, inductions, which, you know, happen in about 40% of births in the U.S. at least, that sometimes people think like, I don't need my doula there, like in the beginning, or the nurse might think, well, they don't need a lot of attention right now because they're still in very early labor. But it seems like it would be really important to have labor support of some kind during those early hours of an induction when you're kind of quote, quote unquote, stuck in bed, that it would be super critical that somebody's actually helping you replicate early labor process that say somebody having a home birth would instinctively be able to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as a doula, that might mean phone support or in person, especially some doulas come and kind of come and go early on in labor. But if you have that, I always like to say that prenatal education where you've talked with people, like if this induction is going to occur, here are the different things that you want to do. As a doula, I love to set up a time to check in with people if I'm not there with them yet in labor. So they might be laboring. We give them kind of a plan to do for the next hour or two. Here are the different positions to try. Remember to move frequently. Let's check in at two o'clock and see how things are going and come up with a new plan so that they don't feel that they're not getting support or that they don't feel lost through what Mm -hmm. they're experiencing, but instead they have a plan of position changes and some comfort techniques to get them through that next hour or two hours. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Like that support early on is crucial just as much as it is later on as well, because we still have a baby trying to navigate their way into the top of the pelvis, which is just as important as the baby navigating their way through the middle and the bottom of the pelvis. Okay. So moving on like further into the labor process, so you're getting into active labor, like what are some tips you have for families in that part of the labor process? Yeah. So one thing that I love to emphasize is that in my opinion, it's less about active labor and more about where is the baby. Okay. So I love to think if we're talking about it in relation to positioning, because for some people, their baby might be midway through the pelvis in active labor, but other people's babies might still be at the inlet. So we want to think about where the baby is in the pelvis. So whether that means someone is gathering that information from internal exams 
or maybe they are just paying attention to the sensations that they're feeling. I love to think, okay, where might the baby be at this point? And let's use that to figure out what positions we're going to suggest next. But when it comes to active labor, I think one thing that's really important for people to pay attention to is whether they're starting to feel some rectal pressure or not, because rectal pressure is a great indicator that the baby is starting to move down a little bit more. And maybe it's time to start thinking, depending on the length that someone is feeling that rectal pressure for, maybe it's our time maybe it's time to start thinking about opening that mid pelvis. Um, so paying attention to the sensations that someone's feeling is really important. Paying attention again to that frequency of movement. If we're thinking, let's still change position every five contractions, that's awesome because we don't have to worry about time. We're just paying attention to the contractions. Let's try something new after five. I think also in an unmedicated birth, getting up and using the bathroom frequently is great. It encourages a lot of movement. It encourages position changes. And then also just getting all of that urine out of the way helps to give the baby a bit more space too. I want to emphasize that, especially in an unmedicated birth, the movements, like you had said earlier, that people are doing are instinctive. So tap into that. Don't be afraid to move. Listen to what the body is telling you to do. Even if it seems weird, even if it seems like not what you've seen in the movies, it's okay. You know, one position that's a favorite of mine is an all fours position with one leg hiked up, either out to the side, maybe like resting on a yoga block, or maybe kind of like a lunge while you're in all fours. That's not a position we get into on a daily basis. When you do that, if you do that for the first time in labor, it's like, this is pretty weird. But practicing that ahead of time and then utilizing things like that, being willing to try them out in labor is important. I also tell people that a support person's role, whether the person laboring is with or without an epidural, the support person is involved in movement by reminding them to change position frequently, by offering a new suggestion so that the person giving birth doesn't have to use that thinking brain and can just kind of follow these kind of simple guidelines. Sometimes people get stuck in one position and it feels daunting to move. So having a little bit of encouragement can be helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love those suggestions. I know being on all fours, resting my head on a birth ball was like my favorite position because yeah. I felt good on my back and I could rest my head completely during the contraction or wave. And then with a partner's role, one thing we teach in the EBB childbirth class is that the partner, you know, that's a big part of their role is to help with facilitating the movement changes. And one thing that we did, my partner and I, Dan, he would – check with me right after a contraction and be like, okay, after the next one, do you want to change positions? And so we'd kind of plan it out, like almost like one contraction ahead. So we'd have a, you know, a break between contractions where he'd ask me if I want to change and well, what do you want to do next? And we'd make it through the next contraction and then we'd immediately change so that we, you know, could discuss it in one break and then implement it in the next break. And that yes. kind of worked well for us, like planning it out. That. I love that. Absolutely. And then it's not too jarring. It's not too much to kind of like, oh, wow, I have to move right now. It's like, okay, I'm going to enjoy this next one. Enjoy this next yeah. contraction. And then I know that it's time to move. I love that idea. Yeah. And now we're going to go to the bathroom or we're going yes. to do something different. Yeah. Yes. So one thing too, you had mentioned that all fours position that you really liked. I find that with my clients, they tend to really love that position. Also, that can totally be done with an epidural on the bed, or it could mm -hmm. be done obviously in an unmedicated birth. And one thing that I love to tell people with that position is incorporate movement into that position. Rock your hips side to side, do some kind of circles with your hips, lean forward, lean back, do some pelvic tilts so that not only do we wind up in a position that is helping to open up space towards the middle and the bottom of the pelvis, possibly at the top, depending on how the thighs are, but also we're actually moving within that position too. And then it's kind of like wiggling the baby down and out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love it. Yeah. <laughs> what about later on, you know, as you're getting closer, when you're feeling a lot of pressure at the bottom, you can tell baby's head is like putting more pressure. What kinds of positions are beneficial for that part of the birthing process? Yeah. So if somebody is feeling rectal pressure through their whole contraction, also in between contractions, but not yet feeling the urge to push, I'm thinking the baby's at the lower portion of the mid pelvis. So I would be really focusing on encouraging a lot of asymmetrical positions that help to open up that space midway through the pelvis. 
if the person is experiencing this constant rectal pressure with an overwhelming urge to bear down, then we're going to start thinking about opening the outlet with positions like bringing the knees closer together, which I know is not what we see in the movies and Mm. often in real life. So we can come back to that. But positions like knees closer together, arching the lower back so that we're actually creating that space at the outlet of the pelvis. If we don't have that information from internal exams about where the baby is in the pelvis, then we really rely a lot on what people are feeling to determine how low the baby might be. When there is, to kind of go back to what I said before, when there's that rectal pressure during the contraction and also in between, but not an urge to bear down just yet, an overwhelming urge to bear down, the baby's nice and low, but we're not quite ready to be pushing yet. So that's that point where we think about asymmetrical positions, which could be a lunge, or it could be a staggered leg position. It could be a position where someone's on their side with that one leg stretched out on the bottom, and then the other leg pulled up towards their chest. Peanut balls are really awesome to support uh, side-lying positions, especially asymmetrical side-lying positions. Okay. And so asymmetrical basically means like one leg is doing something different than the other leg. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And and both to the side, but then also out to the front too, you know? So we want to think not only about lifting one leg out to the side, but also thinking like like a runner's lunge, like staggering front to back also, because that's going to change space between the, the, the pubic bones and the sacrum front to back in the pelvis. Can you talk about like the importance of minimizing interventions when they're not necessary in birth and how that helps with the pelvic biomechanics? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. So we kind of think about physiological birth as the gold standard and Earlier I said we would define that, so we should define that, I guess. (laughs) The physiological birth is pretty much the process when it's not messed with. It's the process when it happens spontaneously and when it continues to unfold without management or intervention. And the research does support that process, that physiological process as being healthiest for the baby and the parent. Now, this doesn't mean that sometimes complications don't occur. That can absolutely happen. But the idea is that even if complications occur, we can still take things one step at a time to adhere as closely as possible to that physiological process. And incorporating movement, especially with a clear understanding as to what movements are optimal at what point, then we're really helping to support that physiological process with benefit without risk. And that's the thing. So when we intervene in the birth process, there's always risk and benefit. And we weigh out those risks and benefits. And sometimes, even though there's risks, it's beneficial to move forward with that intervention. But when we're applying interventions routinely, particularly to a low-risk, healthy birthing population, we wind up in a situation where quite often those risks outweigh those benefits. And when we incorporate movement, that's a really fantastic intervention that only has benefit and not risk. When we have the opportunity to intervene in a way that is only beneficial, there's no reason not to do it. It's kind of mind-blowing to me that movement isn't something that is routine in all births because there is clear benefit and research has shown no harm in movement through labor too. Yeah. I wish we could have like a conversation with real live birth workers and nurses right now because I'm, I'd be really curious. We don't have really recent research from the past couple of years on movement in labor and birth. I know the last major study in 2013, the Listening Mothers study, still found that a lot of people are not moving around once they get to the hospital. And now we have, you know, the popularity of peanut balls has grown and we have other programs like spinning babies and other things where I feel like nurses are getting more education on the importance of movement. Mm -hmm. But I'm really curious. I would love to know like what you think most births where you live in Pennsylvania do they have enough movement or do you think people are mostly just stuck in bed and not really moving that much? That's a great question. I think it depends so much on the individual support that people have, not only from people like doulas, like like professional non-clinical support, but it really depends quite honestly on the nurse that they have. And in our area, I live in South Jersey, but we're like 15 minutes from Philadelphia. Um, So I attend a lot of births in Philadelphia as well as in South Jersey. And 
We are so lucky to have some really fantastic, incredible nurses. And those nurses tend to be either well-versed in positioning or really open to maybe exchanging information with doulas and incorporating movement, even if they're not well-versed in it. But every now and then I do run into a situation where someone, a clinical provider is very reluctant to incorporate movement. Quite often they talk about liability, like this person could fall if they're doing that. Research really doesn't show that people are falling (laughs) in labor. (laughs) And then the thing is too, even when someone has an epidural, we think epidural means no mobility. And that's not the case. Epidural means very little sensation, but you do still have that ability to support yourself, for example, in a position where you're in all fours. And so especially with somebody on either side, just providing like a gentle hand or just, you know, being present, we have that ability to change position in the bed, even with an epidural. And I do think in my experience doing this work for more than a decade, like you said, which does make it sound like a while, I do, I have seen a huge change. When I first started doing this work, there was no discussion of movement. But now I do think that there's much greater awareness about the benefits of it and how to incorporate it. I would love to see even more. And I would love to see understanding of the pelvic dynamics aspect of it too, because I think when we not only incorporate movement, but we also incorporate positions that are specifically based on where the baby is in the pelvis, we have such a fantastic opportunity to just kind of keep things progressing and decrease the risk of things like labor dystocia or labor arrest and failure to progress, that terrible term. Yeah. So movement, I think it's become a lot more quote unquote popular in birth, but I think we still have a ways to go too. All right. Is there there anything else you want to teach us about while we have you with us. Oh my goodness. I think it is important to recognize that the prenatal education component of it is so important. It's very challenging for someone to be in labor and learn new information, learn new things about how they should be moving. So if we are able to reach people prenatally, expectant parents prenatally about the benefits of movement and the ability to move even with pain medication, I think we have an opportunity then to help people feel more empowered in their births and more empowered in speaking up about what they want to do. If they have an understanding as to how the bones of their pelvis move, if they have even watched a short Instagram video or something about movement, then they might be more confident in bringing that into their birth and saying, this is something that I want to do. I think it really does start with parents wanting to incorporate that and then providers recognizing that, oh, this is something that that the client wants. So we need to be well-versed in this also. Mm -hmm. Um, So for parents, yeah, I think boosting your confidence by understanding your bodies a little bit more and being willing to understand more about movement, both in medicated and unmedicated births can be a real game changer. Yeah. And that just goes back to the importance of of education when you're pregnant, like you said, because most parents get their information about birth from the movies, which you already pointed out don't have a very (laughs) positive (laughs) picture of, of movement. It's, you know, on your back with your feet in stirrups and knees wide apart, which you said is not necessarily beneficial for the pushing phase. So, and practicing the position seems like it would be important to like, not just maybe watching videos, but actually trying them out. Yes. So that yes. It's not brand new when you're yes, in labor. Yes, absolutely. I always tell people I'm not um, I'm not a person that believes that you need to train for birth. I really do feel like your body has that innate knowledge of of how to give birth. But we have these big thinking brains that get in the way all the time. And if you've never been in the all fours lunge position and you try it for the first time in labor, your thinking brain is going to say, whoa, this is not something that we're familiar with. We need to get out of this position. But if you've practiced these positions in pregnancy, you've created a little bit of memory there. And now your thinking brain in labor is going to be like, oh yeah, we did this before. This is okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the goals in labor um, is to really decrease that activity in the thinking brain because it can overpower the primal brain and decrease the release of hormones and stall labor out. So if we practice those positions ahead of time, create a little muscle memory, create a little memory in our thinking brain, then we're in a position where we can um, really utilize that even more effectively in labor and birth. Yeah. And I think that a lot of our knowledge about how to cope with labor and how to move in labor was lost over the past 80 years, you know, with the onset of twilight sleep and being confined to the bed during the labor process and things that we might have, you know, a hundred years ago watched 
our moms and aunts and grandmas and other family members do during birth, like yeah. we've never seen before. So yeah. there is a little bit of a learning curve because we're trying to catch back up to where yeah. we used to be. Absolutely. And there's this idea that like, oh, what is my body doing? This is weird. This isn't right. This isn't what I've seen in the movies. I shouldn't be doing this. But if we were watching people give birth, if we were seeing our mother's mother give birth, if we were seeing aunts give birth, um, then we start to see all these different positions and movements that people instinctively do. And then we'd be more comfortable with that in our own births. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we, like, just like what you're saying, if we change the imagery that surrounds birth in this culture, we have a real opportunity to change the way that people approach their experiences. And it, again, it has nothing to do with whether somebody chooses to get pain medication or not, because you can change position when you have an epidural, but it has so much to do with how actively involved we think we we should be during during labor and there's active involvement whether somebody has an epidural or doesn't mm -hmm. are there any projects coming up that you want us to know about yeah, sure. So I have some workshops coming up for birth professionals that you had mentioned in the intro, these workshops that I do for the general community. And I teach one kind of very basic pelvic dynamics and fetal positioning workshop called Creating Space. And I do that both virtually and in person in the Philadelphia area. So we have that coming up. And then I am so excited about this new workshop that I started. I taught it for the first time last June, and it's coming up again in January. And it is pelvic shape, fetal positioning, and obstetrical bias. So it's really different. It incorporates a lot of movement because I, I love to do that. But it's really a historiographical look at where obstetrics started in terms of deciding who was quote unquote better at birthing. And then it follows the pseudoscience that leads to pelvic shape classification and how that kind of affected this idea of optimal fetal positioning and then how we see this play out in obstetrical bias to this day. And then we with end racism. the workshop. What was that? With racism. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. With racism. And with through. so we look at that throughout like the historiographical look. We, we look at the racism that really started obstetrics and started and kind of um, infiltrated its way through every aspect of how people are viewed during labor and birth and how births are managed. And then we end the workshop with a lot of discussion of posterior babies and supporting posterior babies through the process in a way that does not require intervention that brings risk. So it's really fun. It's a totally different type of workshop than what I've ever taught before because it really is a look back at history. But I think in order to be able to best support people who have posterior babies, we have to recognize where a lot of that bias about posterior babies came from. So we really go back to like the mid 1800s or so and take a look at how, how things got started back then with the management of labor and birth. So that's coming up in January. And both that workshop and the Creating Space workshop have contact hours through ACNM. So they're an awesome opportunity for both clinical and non-clinical birth workers to get a little bit of, of uh, extra information. And it really, I think both of those workshops can be real game changers in terms of how you approach births moving forward. And also there are scholarships available for both of those workshops for BIPOC birth workers, um, just to throw that out there too. Awesome. So people can learn more at your website then? Yeah, yeah. My website, okay. I update really frequently. So there's information there. There's a section for parents and then there's also a section for birth workers. Yeah. And so all the information about those workshops and the scholarships and all that are, are on the website. That's super exciting. Thank you for sharing. And so people can go to blossomingbelliesbirth.com yep. and also follow you at Blossoming Bellies Birth. Uh, thank you so much, Brittany, for coming on the podcast. Is, are there any final words you have for us? I just think that people should definitely come out of their births feeling like they did something really awesome. And I think incorporating movement and an understanding of the body is a great way to do that. It's not about how someone gives birth or even, you know, whether things go according to plan, but it's very much about how they feel about giving birth. And when we incorporate movement and encourage movement, we restore a lot of that autonomy back to the person who's birthing and give them an opportunity to come out of their birth feeling like they did something really awesome throughout the process. So yeah, thank you so much for having me. This has been awesome. Yeah, thank you, Brittany. You're welcome. This podcast episode was brought to you by the Evidence-Based Birth Childbirth Class. This is Rebecca speaking. When I walked into the hospital to have my first baby, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Since then, I've met countless parents who felt that they too were unprepared for the birth process and navigating the healthcare system. 
The next time I had a baby, I learned that in order to have the most empowering birth possible, I needed to learn the evidence on childbirth practices. We are now offering the evidence-based birth childbirth class totally online. In your class, you will work with an instructor who will skillfully mentor you and your partner in evidence-based care, comfort measures, and advocacy so that you can both embrace your birth and parenting experiences with courage and confidence. Get empowered with an interactive online childbirth class you and your partner will love. Visit evidencebasedbirth.com slash childbirth class to find your class now.